Thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church with Pastor Steve Hubbard. You can connect with us on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call us at 740-385-8411. If you've got your Bibles this morning, take them to Psalm chapter 38. While you're turning there, children, you are dismissed. We're going to be in Psalm 38. I want you to be there. I want you to mark that. But before we get to our primary text, I want you to take your Bibles over to 1 Samuel chapter number 12. So we're coming back to Psalm 38, but beginning in First Samuel 12. Last week we sounded the alarm, if you were here. I still have it beside me. Some of you are thinking, I hope he doesn't blow that thing again. But you know, that's the way we are spiritually sometimes, too. Just let, me, just, let me, just let me sleep, preacher. I want to I remain just how I am. I want to remain comfortable. Don't, don't stir me, God. Spirit of the living God, just leave me alone. I want to just continue on doing what I'm doing. I just want to continue on being what I'm being because I'm satisfied and I'm comfortable. But don't disturb me too much. You know, the children of Israel found themselves in that same kind of a position because they looked around in 1 Samuel chapter number 8. We're going to be in chapter 12, but in 1 Samuel 8, they looked around. They said, you know what, Samuel, we, we want us a king just like all the other nations. We, we like what's going on in the other nations. We, we like the fact that the king will stand up and fight for us. And, and so, Samuel, we want a king. Samuel was, was brokenhearted because of their request and goes to God, and God says to Samuel, Samuel, remember this. It's not you they're rejecting, they're rejecting me as king. And I think a lot of times, especially as we look at our culture, we look at America, that's just how we are. We'd rather the government fix things than God fix things. I think sometimes we rely more on the government than we do on God. We're more concerned about the government shutdown than we are the spiritual shutdown. And in 1 Samuel chapter number 12, beginning in verse number 14, these were Samuel's words back to the children of Israel at this particular time in their history. And he said, If you will fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both you and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But... If you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as he was against your fathers. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. And so Samuel now comes and and he says, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you how powerful God is. Is it not wheat and harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you for a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we don't die. For we have added unto unto all of our sins this evil to ask for a king. We now realize, we understand that we, we are more dependent on the king than we are on God. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not. Here's the promise. Look, no matter how far you get away, no matter who you're depending on, God is always merciful and gracious. 
And Samuel says, fear not. You have done all this wickedness, yet turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all of your heart. And turn you not aside, for then should you go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if you shall still do wickedly, you will be consumed both you and your king. I'm here to tell you, church, if America does not turn back to God, if God did that to his own people and made that same promise and warning to his own people, then why would he not do it to us? And you're, if you'll remember in the text, it's Samuel who says, I will not cease to pray for you. And so church, I believe without any question, we need to pray for America. We need to pray for our communities. We need to pray for our culture. That God would show his mercy and his grace and send a great spiritual awakening. And maybe that spiritual awakening needs to start in you. That God would awaken your slumbering soul and renew you and your walk with him. And in Psalm chapter number 38, we find, I believe, one of the great reasons why we really simply didn't hear anything. See, if I picked up this foghorn and I blew it again, yeah, some of you are already going for your ears right now because you simply don't want to hear it. It's irritating. It's debilitating. It's disturbing. We just don't want to hear it. I, I, just, I just don't want to hear any more about it. And I believe one of the reasons that spiritually we don't want to hear anything anymore is because we don't want to acknowledge our condition. As you came in this morning, you were handed a, I guess you could call it a, a personal spiritual survey. Did you get one of these when you came in? If you did not, I want you to get one before you go. And I'm going to ask you this afternoon or sometime this week to examine your life spiritually. Take the spiritual dipstick and poke it in your soul and see where you are. Just, just do a checkup. You know, why, why in the world do we take our car to the mechanic? Because we, we don't want it to break down, right? Why do we change the oil from time to time? Because we, if we don't, it's going to break down. Why do, you, why do you fill it up with fuel as often as you need to? Because if you don't, you're going to be sitting on the side of the road, right? So why is it we don't apply those same principles to our lives spiritually? From time to time, we just need to pull into the mechanics garage spiritually and take a, a checkup of our lives and see where we are spiritually. So I'm challenging you this week to do that, that God would stir you in your heart and your spirit and that you wouldn't be the one who, upon the hearing of the sounding of the warning, your first reaction is to Put your fingers in your spiritual ears because you're not willing to recognize the condition that you find yourself in. The psalmist David laments in this psalm and he begins by saying in verse number one, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure, for thine arrows stick fast in me and thy hand presseth sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones. Why? 
Why does he say at the end of verse number 3, what is it? Because of my what? Sin. You see, that's the problem. We don't want to acknowledge sometimes our condition. You're here in one of two or three conditions this morning. You're here either lost in your sinful condition, separated apart from a holy God, or you're sitting here this morning having been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and either one of those conditions, either one of those places from time to time, whether you're lost without Jesus, you need to absolutely repent of your sin and come to Jesus. But there are times in our life as believers that we find ourselves falling prey to sin, and if so, we need to cry out to God. As he says in 1 John chapter number 1 and verse 9, if we confess or acknowledge our sin, he will do what? He will absolutely forgive us. Absolutely forgive us. I wonder this morning, is there some condition that you need to acknowledge personally before the Lord? I would remind you that I don't believe in any way, shape, or form we ever get away with our sin. A holy God, as the psalmist records in verses 1, 2, and 3, is very displeased with our sin. Sometimes I think we think that we can sin and get away with it and it's okay. And God's off up there somewhere in the starry heavens and we can just go on living our life with those little sins. Now I understand and realize when you look at the passage in Psalm chapter number 38 that David is lamenting because of his sin with Bathsheba. You say, well, I've never been in that kind of a place or I've never committed that kind of adulterous sin. I've never, I've never had anyone murdered as David did to her husband Uriah. I, I've never done those kinds of things before. But let me remind you of this, what the book of James says. The book of James says, if you have broken God's law in one way, in one point, you're guilty of it all. Now don't think for a moment that God is any more uh, pleased with your sins in your mind or the sins of a, of a gossip or the sins of lust than he is or was with David when he committed that adulterous act with her. Don't think that for a moment. God is displeased when we sin because what do we do? We sin against a holy God. He is holy and righteous. And David reminds us in the first three verses of the psalm about the fact that God is incredibly incensed over our sin. I really think we just don't get that. How incensed He is with our sin. You say, you mean that God is angry when I sin? Yes, He's angry when we sin. But it wasn't that bad. It doesn't make any difference how bad it was. He's still not happy. Well, I thought God loved everybody. He does love everybody, but he still hates our sin. And we simply don't get away with it. Scripture reminds us, be sure your sins will find you out. Nobody saw me. Oh, yes, he did. Nobody heard me. Oh, yes, he did. Nobody understand or understood the thoughts that I thought. Oh, yes, he did. He sees all. He knows all. He hears all. No matter where you go, the psalmist said in Psalm 139, wherever I go, Even to the depths of hell, he sees everything. We don't get away with our sin. Not only that, but I believe it's it's time that we learn how to take personal responsibility for our sin. Do you notice how the psalmist describes it in verse number 3? At the end of verse number 3, what does he say? He says, it's whose sin? Whose sin? My sin. 
He's taking personal responsibility for his actions. We live in a generation today that wants to point the finger and blame at everybody else in all of their circumstances. Well, it's because I was raised in this kind of home or because of my husband did this or my wife did this or because my children did this or because of this and that and wah, 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 wah. And we never want to take personal responsibility for our own sin. Because it's easier that way, right? Then I, then I go scot-free. I'm good to go. My conscience is clear, so to speak. No, take responsibility for your sin. When the Holy Spirit of God puts his finger on you in your life and says, that's wrong, then say, God, I'm wrong. Again, that goes back to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess... That word literally means to acknowledge. It's not to go to God and say, Oh, Lord, just, just forgive me for all of my sin. You know, that's an easy cop-out on forgiveness, is it not? Just, just forgive me. You know, I'm sinful, you're sinful, we're sinful, we're all sinners, wouldn't you like to be a sinner too? No, no, I am a sinner, and God, I did this. I gossiped about Mary this week. God, I was wrong. I lusted after that woman this week. God, I was wrong. God, I, I overspent like I shouldn't have been. I was a poor steward. God, I was wrong. That's acknowledging your sin before a holy God, not just getting some blanket coverage for your sin. It doesn't work that way. I'm afraid we have a bunch of believers walking around with a bunch of unconfessed sin thinking that we've just gone to God and gotten some blanket coverage. This is not some insurance plan, by the way. It's a serious matter with the Holy God. And it's time we take personal responsibility. And may I say this to you. There's a price to pay for sin. There's a price to pay for sin. There is a payday someday. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow, but someday there's a payday. If you're lost without Jesus Christ, the payday comes in eternity. Not only can you have no peace in this world, but you'll be separated from a holy God forever. And you'll spend an eternity in hell. And that's a long payday. If you know Jesus Christ and you think you can get away with sin in this world, I've got news for you. There's a payday. David knew that all too well as we read down through this psalm. He was experiencing the payday. We're talking about David, right? We're talking about the great psalmist David. We're talking about the shepherd boy who, who spent most of his young years walking and, and keeping the, the sheep and, and, and watching over the flocks and spent most of his time playing on his harp and singing gloriously uh, praise to the Lord. We're talking about the same young man who whipped the lion and the bear. We're talking about the same young man who picked up the three little stones and slung them around and killed Goliath when nobody else in the Israeli army would. We're talking about the same guy? Yes, we're talking about the same guy. We're talking about the same guy who the Bible says was a man after his own heart. We're talking about David. Yes, we're talking about David. He came to the realization that if you sin before a holy God, there is a payday. But I don't think that we're so convinced of that. We think, well, you know, God forgives sin, right? Absolutely he does. Aren't you glad for his forgiveness? Matter of fact, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. Matter of fact, he says he buries it in the sea of forgetfulness. But he never said, he never said, there won't be consequences for your sin. There are natural human consequences that come as a result that God never promised to take away. Don't forget it. And so the psalmist begins to lament the payday. That's what he does. Beginning in verse number 4. 
And in verse number 4 through verse number 14 is a psalmist absolute lament over the consequences of his sin. He was absolutely miserable. Even, even to the point of being paralyzed, if you will, physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally, and spiritually. Listen. Follow along, beginning in verse number 4. For my sin, mine iniquities, he uses an interesting word, the word iniquities, carries with it the idea of the crookedness of sin, or if you will, twisted wickedness. Really, really a different word than the word sin, which simply means to miss the mark. Uh, this word iniquity, David understood his iniquity. What had he done? He had gone home from battle when he should have been on the battlefront, and he looked out off the rooftop, and he said, there's a woman I want, had her brought to him, had sex with her, uh, she had a child, and then the misery began. And then he had her husband, who was one of his choice generals, sent to the, to the battlefront, tried to get him to come home and have sex with his wife so he could blame the child on him. That didn't work, so he sent him to the battlefront to have him killed. You talk about twisted wit. That's what happens. Listen, when you start to disobey God and you don't follow his ways, sooner or later you find yourself in this twisted circle that just spirals down and down and down. And it doesn't get any better until you finally come to your senses, as a psalmist does, and says, it's my sin. It's my problem. It's my fault. I was the one. For mine iniquities are gone over my head, verse 4, as a heavy burden. He says, they're, they're far too heavy for me. His sin was heavy. And verse number 5, he says this, and my wounds stink. And I would have to agree with the psalmist and that sin really stinks. And not only does it stink in our own lives, it stinks in our relationships with others, but it stinks before a holy God. He said, my wounds stink and are corrupt. Why? Again, taking personal responsibility. Do you notice at the end of verse number 5, because of her foolishness, because of his foolishness, because of their foolishness, because of, of the culture's foolishness? No, he says, because of my foolishness. Mine. And he says in verse 6, as a result, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go around mourning all the day long. I'm troubled. It's not just a, the idea of being sad, but he was, he was lamenting heavily and mourning over what had taken place in his life. How it had corrupted his family, corrupted his leadership, corrupted everything around him because he determined he was going to sin. Don't tell me for a moment that as even followers of Jesus Christ, we can't make by our own will and our own fleshly desire, the determination, I'm going to sin. Because we do all the time. It's not just, oh, I don't know how that happened. Oh, well, did you see? I just sinned. <laughs> well, isn't that... I can't believe I just did that. Yes, you can. Now you're lying about it. Verse 7, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. Some commentators even believe, even though we find this no other place than in Psalm 38 when David is talking about it himself, some commentators believe that David may have very well caught a venereal disease as a result of his sexual tryst with Bathsheba. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. Hey, you better be talking about it.
We, we don't have a problem talking about AIDS in the homosexual community, but what about venereal diseases that are running rampant in the heterosexual community because of our unwillingness to contain our own lust and desires? Verse 8, I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness in my heart. He was roaring like a, almost like a lion. He becomes so feeble and weak. Around the palace, no doubt, during those days, David and those around him, his closest confidant, watched as he grieved and it was in great pain, even mentally and physically. Lord, verse number 9, all my desire is before you, and my groaning is not hid from you. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of my eyes, it is, it is almost gone from me. I've lost my vision. Here's the king of Israel, the, the man who, who took Israel in a direction like no other king did. You talk about a visionary. You talk about a leader. You talk about somebody who could give a speech without a teleprompter. It was David. He, he was the one. He was a great, godly leader. And he had come to the point in his life because of sin in his life. He said, I've lost my vision. I have no more vision. I don't have vision for my own personal life. I don't have any more vision for my family. I don't have any more vision for the nation. Because of sin. You see, sometimes I believe we lose our vision for the things of God. We lose our vision for our family. We lose our vision for the church. We lose our vision and passion for reaching the lost because of sin. And it's time we get rid of the sin. In verses 11 and 12, it even gets worse for David. He looked around at his friends, his family. He looked around at all of them. And listen to what he says. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischief things and imagine deceits all the day long. David was all alone. He found himself on an island having fulfilled the desires of the flesh, he finds himself abandoned. And then in verse 13 and 14, but I, as a deaf man, heard not. And I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Thus I was a, as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs, the sweet psalmist became deaf and dumb before the Lord. Couldn't even speak in the presence of the Lord. Didn't even know what to say before God. Why? Because of sin. I wonder, are you willing this morning to acknowledge your condition? What is it in your life that the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on? In you. This is, not, this is not when we look at each other. This is not looking at your wife or your husband or your children or your neighbor or somebody across the church. Oh, yeah, I heard about so and so. No, no, no. This is you. Remember, it's time to step up to the plate, if you will, man up. Or ladies, woman up and take personal responsibility for your sin. In verses 15 and 16, the psalmist continues, and he begins to plead with God to hear him. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. And that begs a question. And here's the question. What is necessary for God to hear us when we find ourselves in that condition, when the Holy Spirit of God 
puts his finger in our life and he identifies or points out something that's a sin in our life. Remember, we're not talking, we're not, we're not saying, listen, all of us has gone out and we, we found some other woman or some other man and we fornicated and we've, we've committed some adulterous act and we've murdered some, not, not some, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about even the little things in your life that you think have gone undone and unchecked, but I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit of God right now in this very moment is putting a check in your life. And he's saying, get rid of it. What does it take for God to hear us? I believe, first of all, it takes genuine humility. See, sometimes it's hard for us to admit that we can't solve our problems. We're pretty self-sufficient, aren't we? We can fix anything. Right? Years ago, it used to be bailing wire for those that used to live on the farm. Your grandpa and great-grandpa, maybe you could fix anything with bailing wire. Now it's duct tape and WD-40. <laughs> and PD blaster, that's right. You can fix anything. My father-in-law is one of those kind of guys. I mean, he just is. If it's broke down, he can fix it. It doesn't make any difference what it is. But I'm here to tell you, I don't care how much duct tape you get, you can get Gorilla Tape if you want to. I don't care how much WD-40 or PB Blaster or bailing wire you use, it's not going to fix your sin problem. You can try all you want to try, you can do all you want to do, but it won't fix it. It takes absolute genuine humility. The psalmist said, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. You know what our problem is, though? All too often, we're too proud. Well, what would somebody else think if they saw me crying out before a holy God, realizing that I've been faking it all these years, I've been sitting in church all these years, and I really don't have a relationship with a holy God? What would they think? Hey, listen, it doesn't matter what they think. What matters is what God thinks. Well, what would they think if, they, if, if, if I was before God and, and I was crying out to God because of, of this sin or that? Hey, it doesn't matter what they think. It takes genuine humility. But it also takes unconditional surrender. Many of you know all too well that international sign of surrender I don't care where you go, where you serve, in any military in the world, whether you know the language or not, if you're in the battlefront and you want to surrender, you know what you have to do? Either you raise a white flag or you do this. Everybody knows what that means. I give up. I surrender. And you know what? That's exactly what it takes for God to hear. You must first of all be genuinely humble. You must absolutely, unconditionally surrender. The psalmist said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But I believe it also requires a plea for mercy. You see, apart from Christ, we have no value that merits God's favor. The only one who can give you and I mercy is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he shed his blood, so that he could show us mercy. And that mercy was not just good enough when we came to the cross for the first time to receive his redemptive work, but his mercy is good for you and I every day when we find ourselves falling prey to sin. It's in Lamentations, the writer says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. But I believe also it takes personal helplessness. John chapter 15 and verse 5. What does it say? Without me. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. I believe it absolutely takes faith in God's power and resources. 
You see, sometimes we limit God and His ability and His power and His resources. We read the book of Acts and we, and we think about those early days and we think, wow, look at what God did in those early days. And I realize He was kick-starting the church and He was demonstrating and doing miracles and doing mighty things and, and glorious things for His honor and for His glory. But I'm here to tell you, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change what makes us think for a moment that he's not as powerful today as he was a thousand years ago. Or he's not as powerful today as he was before the foundations of the world were even formed. He's still the same. We limit him. We put him in our little Christian box and we think, well, I don't know that God can really come through on this, but I'll pray anyway, Lord. You know, I need your help here. Would you help me out? Okay, I'll work on that. And then what do we do? We just jump in God's way and we do it our way. I believe without any question for God to hear us, we must have faith in God's power and resources. Without faith, the writer of Hebrews says it's impossible to please Him. But lastly, I want you to hear this. Listen carefully. It takes desperation. Desperation. See, we're desperate about a lot of things, right? My daughter, Cherise, the other night, I was here Monday night. My phone went off and I saw it was Cherise. I said, I better answer that. So I slipped out from our meeting. Dad, Dad, well, what is it, Cherise? What's going on? She's in, you know, she lives in Columbus now. What's the matter? What's going on? I'm thinking, you know, everything, everything just wildly imaginable, you know. She's been abducted. She's broke down on 270. I mean, something. Right? We always go to the worst, right? Dad, I cut my finger. <laughs> Oh, I, no, Dad, I, I cut it off. I cut it off. I said, you cut your finger off? You need to get to the urgent care. Get some. Oh, it's, it's like, oh, how did you cut it? Well, I cut it right. Well, she's not here today. So if you look at the end of her thumb, she cut a little teeny weeny piece off the end of her thumb. But I'm telling you, she was desperate. She, she was cutting up onions. And I mean, she's blood is going everywhere, Dad. I feel like I'm going to pass out, Dad. And she is desperate. She was really desperate. Don't you tell her I told this story, all right? I'll be the one to be desperate. Oh, you get on camera. Oh, great. <laughs> Facebook is closed down for the rest of the day. It's, it's not available to any of you sinners, okay? Hallelujah, all right. But I want you to think about that. You ever been desperate over something? You know, you, you mamas know that well, right? A new little baby, and you go in, and they're, you know, they got the croup. They can't breathe. You know, especially as a new mother. After you've had three or four, it's like, oh, they're okay. You know, you just go on. <laughs> but when you get that first one, I mean, you are running around frantic. You know, you're calling the doctors. You know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And, and you're, just, you're desperate, right? You know what I'm saying? Maybe you've gotten the pink slip from work, lost your job. Remember how desperate you were when you got that? Maybe you got served unbeknownst to you divorce papers or that Dear John letter. Remember how desperate you were then? Maybe you just rear-ended somebody on the highway. It's your fault. Somebody was hurt in the other car or maybe in your car. Remember how desperate you were then? Now we could go on and on case after case, scenario after scenario, where 
in our lives on a regular basis, on a regular basis. I promise you sometime this week, no doubt most of us will be in a desperate situation. But I wonder, I wonder, how desperate are we over our sin? How desperate are you over the fact that you're lost and you don't know Jesus Christ and you're on your way to hell? How desperate are you? How desperate are you over where our nation is in its spiritual condition? How desperate are you? Dad! 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 Now, we're not that desperate yet. We're too embarrassed. What if somebody heard me crying out to God? Well, heaven forbid. Do you hear me, church? And I hate to say it, but this preacher is guilty too. I wonder this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning without Jesus Christ and you would be honest enough to say, I'm desperate for God. I need Jesus in my life. I realize that I'm lost. I have no hope of eternity. And I'm done doing things my way. I'm ready to turn my life over to God surrender my sin and myself to him. I wonder if anyone here this morning is really that desperate. Again, we want to thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call the church office at 740-385-8411. Whisper.